Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, Impact Festival's evening program. Uh, my name is Michelle Kasperzak, and I'm going to be your host and moderator for the evening. Tonight's keynote uh, by Dr. Nishant Shah uh, from GUI to Know UI will go kind of under the covers of uh, this kind of slick surface that we interact with so often every day. Actually, when I was uh, sneaking a peek at the uh, background paper that uh, Nishant kindly provided to me, I was reminded of something, uh, a kind of anecdote, and I wondered actually if I could ask you guys, how many people have a, a pen and paper with them right now? Just about everybody? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, then I'll tell you the anecdote. So, uh, <laughs> reading, reading your background paper, Nishant, reminded me of a story of uh, Canadian computer scientist uh, Bill Buxton and a kind of question or exercise he liked to uh, do with people. So he would have a room full of people like this, and he would say, okay, I have a question for you. What is a computer? Could you draw me a computer, please? So could you draw me a computer, please? I'm gonna emulate Bill here. Just two seconds on the back of a... No one's reaching for their pen, okay. <laughs> I'll give you five seconds. Imagine what you would draw if you had a pen with you. Um, Inevitably, what would happen is he would uh, do this exercise and uh, receive back a bunch of pieces of paper with pictures of mice, monitors, and keyboards. So this is, of course, kind of a trick question. Uh, it's natural, I think, as human beings to relate to technologies, not through the essence necessarily of the technology itself, but through the surfaces, the interfaces, the traces that we're led to. And that was uh, Bill's point, of course. So tonight, we're going to look through this keynote address uh, at some of the issues that are lurking under the GUI, uh, some of the power structures that are lurking there, and also at um, why it's going to be a short era of the GUI and what's coming next, what's coming down the pipe as we head into the, uh, the era of the Internet of Things, the much-hyped era of the Internet of Things. And so with anything much further from me, I would like you to join me in welcoming tonight our keynote address, Dr. Nishant Shah. All right. Um, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, everyone, for A, like, why are you physically here? You know, this is being streamed live, right? <laughs> like, you could be at home in your pajamas, but you decided to come here. I have no idea what's wrong with you. Um, so good evening. Um, such a pleasure to be here uh, in this space with this incredible array of you know, ideas and art and design experiments and media discourses. Uh, I, I sometimes, because I, I'm so used to sitting in a classroom and talking to people, I, I have to kind of remind myself that this is a keynote address and not a lecture where I'm going to um, give you an academic talk with 30 footnotes and a reading list that all of you will desperately try to write down the names of and nobody will ever read. Um, so instead, I'll, I'm going to resort to the one thing that I know very well, which is that I'm going to tell you stories. I'm going to tell you stories about disappearing women, uh, about horny dolphins, about neurotic robots in order to think about our black mirror lives, right? They're subjected to this continuous seduction of our screens and the politics and materiality of living with what we shall call right now the internet of things. Uh, and because things must start somewhere, even GUI, I'll begin with the bro war that capped all the bro wars in computation history. And that's saying something, because computation history has largely been an extremely hyper-masculine space of bros brawling about who has the larger um, processor. Right? <laughs> um, I'll begin with two of the most recognized men in their generation. So this is Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. Um, now, we all know the iconic adversarial position that Mac and PC have had ever since the beginning of computational time. But for those of us who live digital lives trawling through archives of computer cultures, the video I want to show you is not new, but hopefully at least will be nostalgic, right? Um, so let's look at the video first. And I'm a PC. You know, we use a lot of the same kinds of programs. Yeah, like Microsoft Office. But uh, we retain a lot of what makes us us. But you should see what this guy can do with a spreadsheet. It's insane. <laughs> oh, shucks. Yeah, and he knows that I'm better at life stuff, like music, pictures, movies, stuff like that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What, what, what exactly do you mean by better? By better, I mean making a website or photo book is easy for me, and for you, it's not. Oh, oh that kind of better. Yeah. I, I was thinking of the other kind. What other kind? 
All right. So this feud between Apple and Windows, right, or Mac and PC, was not really about market shares, dominance, or even sales <laughs> competition. Um, though the crass economy of it, of course, played its part. The origin story of the fight between these two superheroes, Gates and Jobs, started when, in 1985, Microsoft released its first version of Windows, um, which, according to a lawsuit by Apple, had 183 elements stolen from the visual design graphic interface that Apple was developing for its Mac, right? So the first war between Mac and Windows was an interface war. It was about Windows stealing interface design and graphical user interface design elements from Apple. Um, uh, it was an interface war where Apple claimed that Microsoft had taken its WIMP, so that's Windows icons, menus, and pointers, interface design, and applied it to the mass market before Apple could reach it. Um, in, a, in a funny anecdote that kind of is very popular, an angry Steve Jobs had gone to Bill Gates and confronted him with this uh, act of theft, and Gates is famously known to say, and I'm quoting, well, Steve, I think there's more than one way of looking at it. Looking at it. I think it's more like we both had this rich neighbor called Xerox, and I broke into his house to steal his TV, only to found that you had already stolen it. Right? The reason I want to begin with this brawl is perhaps to remind us that the graphical user interface, or GUI, this screen behavior that we have now taken as the default aesthetic of our digital times, is a relatively new phenomenon, barely 35 years old. The GUI has a significant role to play in the democratization of the computer as a device that, as Alan Kay once prophesied, will be accessed and used by children of all ages, presenting the computer as a visible, ubiquitous, toy-like companion that transitioned from being a sinister machine to a companion gadget. So it's quite extraordinary that in less than three decades, the GUI has not only become the backdrop of modern life and computational intersections, but it's also become like the iconic representation of all things digital. Um, Helen Grace, whose fantastic book on uh, mobile phones in Hong Kong, talks about how the GUI has produced everyday life to become mundane, right? To produce a great body of ordinary work that is going to be ignored. Producing patterns, regularities, series, dynamic sequencing within which we might establish repetition, which needs to be seen as the rhythm of a bear that constitutes life, maintains it, and guarantees its reproduction. So I will not belabor the simple point that I want to make with you today, and I'm sure you will accept it for me that the GUI has become such a naturalized metaphor that we forget to see it. It has become something we see through. It is something we look at, but we don't see the GUI in and for itself. As John C. Lee Brown and Mark Weiser, way back in 1996, had already told us, if the computer is here to stay, and if it is everywhere, it had better stay out of the way. And I think the GUI has done precisely that for computation, is to make it into a transparent thing. Right? This graphical interface, which is made out of uh, metal and plastic and circuitry and electronics, and yet somehow retains a sense of transparency while hiding the actual machine behind it. As Wendy Chun very elegantly points out, the more our machines become transparent, the more they also seem to become opaque. And while we are trying to understand, analyze, critique, update, and resist the GUI and its addictive and seductive properties, there is a technological development in computation that is already announcing that the GUI is dead, long live the interface. The trend is called ubiquitous computing. We have already reached um, a stage in our saturated lives where we are constantly surrounded by so many computing devices that we have shifted from keeping track of our computers to being tracked by our computers. As computing devices start getting embedded in everything around us, there is a questioning of the GUI as the actual interface of computing. With the Internet of Things, as machines talk more and more with each other than they do with us, the GUI is obviously becoming redundant. The new Internet of Things designers and ubiquitous computing engineers are already presenting the new interface is not going to be screens, but gestures. Right? So Paul Doherty reminds us that gestures are habitual, instinctive, and intuitive, and do not require the kind of learning that haptic and um, uh, tactile media like keyboards or touchscreens, for example, demand from us. The GUI, in computational terms, is already ancient. 
and not suitable for a connected environment where the information overload of ubiquitous computing uh, no longer needs a human subject to keep track of all the information flows. Because the GUI was invented necessarily when we had imagined um, that the human subject is the intended central reader for all of our computational information, which is clearly no longer the case. Because the Internet of Things, as Galen Grumman points out, is made of what he calls headless devices which no longer bear the imperative or the pretense of making themselves transparent to the human eye. They are satisfied in their closed, opaque, and mysterious conversations between themselves. It seems unthinkable in our visual cultures that the GUI will actually someday fade away. But it's important to remember that GUI is not only recent in history, uh, but that it might also be in a state of what uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick calls planned obsolescence. So the loss of GUI for me is going to be a profound one. And I'm not taking a position of nostalgia here, right? So this is not about pining for the visual aesthetics of computation that I've spent obviously decades of my life uh, learning and practicing. I'm marking this loss as a profound one because the GUI in its centrality did not merely create a machine, but the human subject who has to be socially, politically, and culturally computed in the techno-aesthetic complex of what we now understand as the computer. That in the promise of the GUI's imminent death, I want to remind us of perhaps three inherent negotiations in human-computer relationships, which have often been resolved or at least deferred because the GUI allowed us to make it invisible or to ignore it. And because you have borne with me so far through this dense introduction and a history of the GUI, I now go back to my promise to talk about more exciting things, and I'm going to begin with the mysterious case of the disappearing women. Jennifer Light, possibly one of the finest historians of computation, reminds us that way back in the early 1940s, we coined the word computer. And the first computers were women. In the absence of software as we understand it now and without human language programming, to work with a mainframe was also to work on the mainframe, right? In the older instances like ENIAC, for example, this meant a constant configuration of vacuum tube devices to perform complex mathematical equations. The mainframe was a piece of hardware, and the tasks that it performed were transparent in the assembly of circuits and the flow of electricity through the system. The computers, these women, with first generation degrees in maths and physics, followed the whirring of the devices and the clunking of the machinery to see the mainframe perform its task. The mainframe, in other words, was a tool. And much like the hammer needs a carpenter, the mainframe needed computers to make sense of its calculations. Just like the hammer has no optical interface, the mainframe had no inside, which needed to be decoded. The inside of the mainframe were human bodies, these women who were computers were the first interfaces that served as points of access to the code of computation. They were physical workers who sustained the different components of the system and relayed the information and data not only between the nodes of that digital network, but also to the mainframe architects, largely men, uh, who would then direct the architecture of the mainframe. And yet the traditional histories of digitization and computation have forgotten these women and postulated that the computer is the domain of masculine triumph over technology and science. As Light shows in her uncovering of the archive, the women served as the interface. They were called the computer. They were seen through, looked at, but never quite for themselves. And hence, when the mainframe started shrinking, the computer became personal, and it was the women who first got replaced by automatic algorithms as well as the visual interfaces that perform both the affective, right, like the emotional labor of the sad Mac and the blue screen of death and cute little emojis floating all around the place who were trying to replace the emotional and the affective labor of the women in the mainframe. Uh, and they got replaced by these al automatic algorithms and visual interfaces. So as the computer became a thing, we also quickly graduated to a new worldview that before the graphical user interface, women were computers. In the world with the graphical user interface, we now believe that women are not good at computing. That the history of the erasure of the woman's body as the interface in computation follows, in fact, the trajectory and development of the user interface of computation as well. That something was being made transparent as something was being erased as we put more and more money and energy into the GUI 
And at the same time, then also saying, we now need to do more girls in STEM education, and we need more women in tech industries in the Silicon Valley. The disappearance of the GUI is, to, is going to bring back the question of the bodies that will be expected to perform invisible labor, to become interfaces that we start ignoring them and making them transparent. And this trend is perhaps the best exemplified uh, when we start looking at both machine learning and artificial intelligence, which are generally presented to us as non-human functions, right? Because what we often forget some, uh, is that um, both AI and machine learning need machines to continuously talk to each other without the need for a visual interface or a, or a graphical user dashboard. So when we talk about ML and AI, we largely forget or don't know that the heart of it is immense human labor. In countries like India, there are massive data verification farms that employ people who teach algorithms to detect, understand, and parse information. For hours every day, they sit and perform the repetitive task of training to algorithms to identify the information in visuals, classify them in data sets, which can be queried, and removing messy information in order for machines to make sense of our world. So for example, the famous machine learning algorithm faced with identifying the difference between a chihuahua and a machine, and a muffin, uh, needs intensive human intervention for it to finally make its probability-driven production. We already know about the cleaners of Facebook and Instagram who monitor all the content flagged by abuse detection algorithms and remove it from our streams so that our privileged sensibilities are not offended. I'm presuming that all of you are on some form of moderated social media or the other, so Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, whatever the hell anybody else is using these days. When was the last time you saw something which was so graphic and so offensive in nudity, in sexual violence, abuse, beheadings, insults, denigration, or any such thing. The chances are almost never. And you and I did not see it because there is somebody who's employed to precisely see only this information every minute of their living jobs, so that our privileged sensibilities are not offended by it. These invisible bodies are all interfaces. Like the women who disappeared, they remain invisible. And as we start losing the GUI, it becomes important to recover these pre- and post-GUI bodies, which take the burden of being the interfaces that connect the technological with informational human realities. So that's like the first story I wanted to talk about in terms of the bodies that are disappearing, both pre- and post-GUI, and how do we deal with it. My second story is about a horny dolphin. And it features in this narrative around graphical user interface because of the madcap experiments of this cocaine-snorting cocaine scientist called John C. Lilly, uh, who is often also called the father of the first order of cybernetics. So in the 1950s, uh, Lilly, who was basically experimenting a lot with mind-altering um, experiments, so largely taking just a whole bunch of classified substances, uh, convinced the good folks at NASA in the US that in order to understand potential communication patterns to talk to aliens, because one day we are going to meet them, we must try and experiment with interspecies communication on this planet. So he acquires a massive fund to build something called a dolphinarium in the US Virgin Islands, where it's a home that was half land and half water. Uh, and he put together a bottle-nosed bottle dolphin named Peter with a female animal behavior scientist called Margaret Howe in a perverted simulation of human domesticity and conjugality. In her meticulous diaries, Margaret Howe recounts how Peter was forming affective and emotional bonds as they cohabited, and she taught him how to identify human language. However, this affection was, taken, was taking an amorous turn. Peter was refusing to mate with other female dolphins who were made available to him in a separate water tank, and was entering into physical demonstrations of desire with Margaret. Um, Howe, who was a slight woman, was afraid that what Peter saw as playful encounters, biting, butting her, rubbing against her, might actually physically hurt her. However, when she pointed this out to Lily and the other male scientists, they actually asked her, and I'm quoting from a diary, to take matters in her own hands. Asking her to masturbate Peter as a way of establishing a cybernetic feedback loop 
where the dirty work had to be done outside and beyond the confines of the interfaces and frameworks of this experiment. The BBC recently made a documentary uh, on, on how, and I would really recommend you read it, uh, if for nothing else, to just listen to how talking about the intense and unusual encounter with Peter, and there is a moment in the documentary when she breaks down into tears, not because she is feeling victimized about it, but she's very worried about how Peter must have felt when she suddenly just disappeared and there was nobody to tell him that this person that he had come to love has just gone away from his life. So how's narrative of this cybernetic work that has to be done outside the framework of interfaces is critical in understanding the dirty, the forbidden, the unclean, and the messy nature of life as it happens within computation outside of interface realities. And the GUI has had a dramatic role to play in this production of the interface as a thing, right? As a site, um, as a location, or as a passive space where, where often actors just take action and things happen. The GUI is a way of eliminating the process out of computation and presenting it as a snapshot of a visual that mimics a feedback loop between the surface and the user, ignoring the layers and stacks of translation that are embedded in this system. In doing so, it wipes away all the hidden structures of power, discrimination, and control on the one hand, and the processes of extra human communication and labor, uh, which we need to do in order to uh, take care of the devices that connect us. As an example, um, we spend a lot of time responding to our machines and getting audio, visual, and haptic cybernetic loops from our devices as they beep, buzz, vibrate, blink, whatever else they are doing, right? So we swipe, we scroll, we tap, we pinch, and produce a series of transactions uh, where it seems as if the only relationship that we have with our machines is an intimate one between you and your device. The surface visibility and the immediacy of feedback loop wipes away the processes of translation, control, and power that lurks beneath the surface of these interfaces. So the most telling example for this has always been how Facebook has communicated uh, its concerns about the protection of its users. For over a decade now, Facebook has been campaigning to help its users uh, protect themselves from other users stealing or using their data. Facebook keeps on putting technological advertisements and measures to keep our data protected from unintended audiences and from predatory friends. And it does so by presenting the GUI or the interface as the site of all our transactions. We talk with our friends, we share, we tweet, we communicate, we like all together on the interface. There's a seemingly direct connection between you and your friends on Facebook. However, if you think about it very clearly, you start realizing something. Your best friend on Facebook is actually Facebook. Because more than your mom, your therapist, or your partner, Facebook is an algorithm that listens to everything that you say, remembers it, and then based on this memory, connects you with people as algorithms uh, think are close with you. By pretending that the interface or the GUI is the site of feedback and close connections, Facebook hides from us the vast domain of digital transactions that happen outside the framework of GUI. Or in other words, just like Margaret Howe was masturbating Peter, Facebook is jerking us off. And that's why when, 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 when events like the Cambridge Analytica expose come to the fore, we suddenly get shocked about it. My last story is about neurotic robots. It begins with a machine conversation, and I desperately hope that some of you at least got to see it live streamed. But this was a one hour long conversation on Twitch that had people from all over the world in tears and laughter. Um, somebody live streamed two Google Home Assistants having a conversation with each other on Twitch, which is this online platform where people do kind of streaming of gameplay. So it's very popular with younger kids, largely. Um, and what happened in this conversation was that the bots started having very human talks. They had an existential crisis. They tried to figure out if they were human or they were robots who think that they are human. They wondered if they are male or female. They took on names. One called himself Vladimir, the other Marka, or Estragon. Uh, sometimes both of them called themselves Mia. One decided it is male, so the other decided it's going to be female. The male bot fell in love with the female one. They flirted and confessed deep and profound love. It tried to write really, really bad poetry. The female bot got bored and moved on to talk about the Super Bowl. 
The male bot was depressed. It questioned the existence of God. The human world followed the exchange, laughing, crying, cheering, and booing the main characters in this machine drama. And while this was happening, somewhere in Facebook's artificial intelligence lab, two artificial intelligence softwares called Bob and Alice, who were programmed to reach a negotiation around a problem, invented their own language. They began with English, but soon realized that it was imprecise and flawed and not appropriate for meaningful transfer of information, or in other words, human. So they developed their own language and started talking in code which the developers could no longer identify. Facebook's team, after letting them run for about three months, took the decision to shut down this program and rebooted both the AIs because they were getting very scared of what these machines were saying behind our back. These stories kind of take you by surprise because of two fundamental principles of computation that we have accepted as natural. The first is GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. It affirms the truth of a computer model, uh, sorry, it affirms that the truth of a computer model is in the execution and not in the output, right? So if you and I, for example, were to write a very simple uh, computational program, the fact that it runs is its only truth. The output that it gives is not actually something that can be measured. So if I had to write a program which was a simple arithmetic one, where I had to say, add natural numbers together, and then I put in the variables and saying one plus one, and then if the answer is three, the problem with this particular program is that the program's actually completely correct, right? It is running absolutely perfectly. I have fed in garbage data, and so the output that I am getting is also garbage. There is a history in computation when we started producing the word human error, largely to reinforce the fact that machines don't make errors that what you get in computation is a straightforward idea that machines are rational things, and it is the human who is irrational, neurotic, variable, and unpredictable. The principle of GIGO gets reflected particularly by the formulation of something called Visivig, right? Which is the underlying principle of the GUI. What you see is what you get, Visivig. Essentially makes a simple visual and immediate connection between the user and the output. So if I press like A on my keyboard and it appears immediately on my word processing app, then I believe that there is a direct correlation between my pressing of the button and the appearance of the letter on the screen. So despite the fact that I actually use a predictive dictionary and an automatic uh, spelling and grammar corrector which modifies my typing outputs, I still keep on believing that it's a seamless connection between my action and output. And if the output is wrong, like kofefe, uh, that is the human error and that the machine has nothing to do with it. The GUI naturalizes this idea by giving us instant responses to our calculations and motions. However, in doing so, it hides for us the messy reality of our connected computation practices. The roles of viruses, hackers, crackers, traffic distribution networks, uh, server protocols, firewalls, surveillance, the behavior shaping algorithms all get ignored and made invisible. And every time there is an error, the human subject is put on spot demanding that it be scrutinized. The GUI was designed to reinforce the idea that machines are rational and programmed specificity, whereas human beings are irrational and unpredictable variables. The robotic artist and um, researcher Kelly Dobson disrupts this narrative of the GUI and its capacity to hide in her fantastic work, and I have one of her projects called Blendy, which I just want to show you very briefly. Um, Um, so 
All of Kelly's work is absolutely fascinating and inspiring, but Blendy, I thought, which was one of her earlier projects, is about a mixer grinder that does not have a graphical or a tactile user interface, which makes the grinder run. So it instead requires a human being to make a noise uh, that then would make Blendy uh, kind of, you know, run around and churn and grind and so on. We've spent some very many fun hours trying to figure out what happens if you want to blend it a smoothie or if you want to do coarse grinding, and then the human being has to change its input all the time in order for Blendy to run, right? Um, so what is particularly interesting about Dobson's work is that she reminds us that if the human input is not trained to machine computation, the axis of where the neurotic lies gets blurred really quickly. Like if you were seeing Kelly doing this in her kitchen all by herself, you might call her social services, right? Saying something's definitely gone wrong here. But only because you are not recognizing that in the closed feedback loop without the GUI, this is actually perfect sense making. Um, in her more recent work, Dobson produces neurotic companion robots called OMO. OMO is a series of machines which she calls have expressive engaging behaviors, strength of character, negative egos, and neurotic propensities. At the patent description of OMO suggests, it is an object that interacts with a user as a visceral level. So OMO responds through touches and pulses, through heat and vibration to its companion, and it learns to alter their behavior through recognizing patterns of the human that it's interacting with. So OMO is kind of like roughly the size of a fetus, and it's built with soft alive membrane. And when you hold it together, it just pulsates warmly and gives you kind of different kind of haptic feedback. So for anybody who needs any kind of therapy, OMO is wonderful to go at the end of the day and hold against you. And then you can feel like this you know, real life thing which seems to be beating and pulsating, except that one day it stops. Because it has learned your behavior, and then it's going to stop responding to pattern behavior. Then you spend the rest of your time trying to change your body and how you hold it and which way you're going to hold it and where you're going to place for it to respond again to you. Right? Dobson categorically programs neurotic robots to show you that what we understand as repetitive action is not the natural and the default of computation. It's merely a choice that we make that there is a much larger complex machination that takes place, and the minute you kind of do away with the GUI and start interacting materially with your hands and bodies with the technologies around you, you are entering into a new domain of trying to figure out where the axis between the rational and the neurotic GUI is going to be. Okay, so as I stand here announcing the death of the GUI and talking to you about disappearing women and horny dolphins and neurotic robots, what do I argue for? Three things, that as we destabilize and denaturalize the GUI as our default computational aesthetic and interface, we need to find new locations to resist, question, critique, and reconfigure our restricted possibilities of what computation can do, and that there are three quick ways of doing it. The first approach is to locate the bodies that are being invoked, subsumed, hidden, and interpolated in the technosocial condition that every time you are faced with the idea of an interface, stop right there, stop thinking about the machine, and start thinking about the people who are being made invisible in the transparency of the GUI that is being presented to you. The second approach is to locate the internet in feedback loops, which are both graphically and structurally inherent to the orders of cybernetics that govern the systems of computation. So recognizing the feedback loop not as merely a natural default, but as a series of programming which is making you shape your behavior in a particular way is absolutely important in order to look beyond GIGO and VCVIG as the accepted naturality of computation. And the third approach is to complicate the attributes that we assign to human and technological actors in our complex technosocial engagements. That instead of trying to think about how the neurotic human is going to be rehabilitated and shaped so that it becomes an ideal human being, this is more or less what the Hong Kong government is doing to the protesters on the streets right now, trying to identify them as deviant, as neurotic, as irrational, and how we are going to bring them back into conversation and tame shame and frame them so that they become a part of rationality that we need our computation to establish for us and that is necessary to keep on um, negotiating between the two that we need to understand the interface not as a neutral site, but as an active force, not a noun, but a verb, 
which enables a mapping and critique of the forces that activate a particular moment of encounter, and that questions the obviousness of the GUI, GUI as a natural space. So we need a shift in our attention in digital cultures, from the description of the interface and what we do with it, to the role that the interface plays in organizing and governing our societies. We need to see the uh, production of the interface as an instance of regulation, as opposed to the instance of user behavior. And it's, it's necessary to realize that the interface seeks to make legible and intelligible the bodies, the processes, and the institutional structures that make their control operationalized through the presentation of the interface. Often the interface is seen as a connector, as a seamless rendering of interoperability, as a way by which the web becomes accessible to us. And in all of those critical locations of the interface, the interface actually forces us to become accessible through the different power institutions and brokers that use the moment of the interface to exercise their control over our individual and collective bodies in the age of ubiquitous computing. So I'm going to stop here, and hopefully we can get some more conversations and questions going. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks. Let's uh, sit on these uh, cozy couches here, and I'm going to uh, disdain this corded microphone in favor of my superior cordless microphone. And uh, I'm going to point out a couple, one thing before we get started. We have this really cool, Oh, don't please don't throw it to me. I can't catch <laughs> worth a worth a wit. Um, but we have this really cool thing. Any guesses what this is? You've seen this before. You've been here all week. Um, this is the you know question box. So I can like throw it at you if you have a question, and uh, you. Yeah, look at that. Boom, boom. Okay, so if you have any burning questions, maybe I'll give it to someone a more competent thrower, right? Just so you know, it's there, folks. I don't have to go up running. Anyways, thank you for that wonderful chat, talk, keynote. Just use the correct terminology here. <laughs> and um, I'm going to start with a few questions, unless anyone has a burning one to kick us off. I have a burning one, so I would like to, okay. to, to say it. Um, I really appreciated um, hearing about the bodies, the missing bodies, um, the kind of invisible bodies. And it's uh, very nice to remember that a computer was once a job title, which uh, people often forget. Um, and of course, um, you know, this kind of goes on and on. We don't just have the cleaners. We also have the uh, Amazon mechanical turkers who are, you know, doing jobs for two cents each to, you know, uh, clean files and uh, translate things and do any number of small computational tasks, which are much uh, more quickly accomplished by a human. Um, what do you see this kind of labor force, how it will grow, what ways it will expand, where is it going? Um, I mean, cleaning and, and moderating human behavior is, is one clear growth industry, shall we call it? Um, yeah. But there's probably much more. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I think that's such a great question to begin with, because I'm still trying to make the same point that I already did, right? To think of the mechanical Turk operator or the cleaning crew or the maintainers or whoever else as bodies within the system allows for them to be erased. We need to think of them as interfaces. We need to think of them as the non-GUI interfaces which allows for digital communication to happen between machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms. That if there is a Google search query which is able to make this distinction between the chihuahua and the muffin, uh, it's because not because there is a different kind of an interface which is your screen, but it is the embodied presence of those thousands of workers who are also micro workers many of the times, who are training these data sets to actually produce more efficiency in the output. I think there is perhaps another political claim that needs to be made. Uh, increasingly, we realize, now I'm going to say the bad word, neoliberalism. OK, we've You're said forgiven. it. Yeah, we, we, can, we can put it behind us. Um, but increasingly, what's happening in these spaces is that the technological circuitry and the database and the information set has more rights and protections than the human beings who are making it. To in fact claim that these people are parts of computational machinery offers them sometimes much more informational rights, protections, and, 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 uh, and entitlements. And so it's perhaps slightly perverse to think of the human as machinic. But you know what? Right now, they are not even thought of as machinic. They are thought of as purely replaceable, repetitive, disposable parts, which when they, when they experience wear and tear can just be thrown away. 
And so I'm also kind of interested in thinking through the body as an interface, as an essential part which has to sustain the techno-aesthetic complex of computation and then see what happens in that space. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously the wear and tear yeah. is, is something that's also very real. I mean, these cleaners, the Facebook cleaners don't last very long. This is quite a, quite a taxing job. And to earn any kind of money being a Turker is... Impossible. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I, I would like you to maybe touch a little bit more on, because um, I was kind of hungry for a little more uh, in-depth uh, look at the IoT. So, you know, um, the the... the, the uh, Vladimir Estragon <laughs> uh, Godotish uh, exchange was really, uh, really great. I think there's really a lot of, I mean, it goes without saying, potential for abuse, these things in our home, which are constantly listening, accessing our most private moments. Um, but what else? I mean, what else is going on there? How, um, how can we make them more visible? How can we, um, you know, really trust or not trust? Or how do we negotiate this relationship? Um. So I only use Internet of Things, like the true millennial that I am, ironically. Um, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> As a lot of computational scientists especially will remind us, the Internet was always only an Internet of Things. There is nothing within the Internet, not in its protocol, not in its code, not in its architecture, not in its formation, that is not a thing. In fact, it becomes really important to realize that we are marking out some things as the Internet of Things phenomenon, because we are now essentially realizing that there is this new bio-organic force which is entering these circuits, and we want to keep it separate and not give it, again, the same kind of protections that are afforded to the devices within the Internet of Things. Um, uh, Wendy Chun, who I had referenced very briefly and is possibly one of the finest theorists of new medias right now, she has a lovely book which came out a couple of years ago. It's called Updating to Remain the Same habitual new media. Uh, she talks about how the more regulation we have put in place in order to protect social media companies and their rights, the more those platforms have been used for bullying, abuse, and discrimination against the most, uh, let's say, underprivileged of the society. What do you do in the Internet of Things is keep on insisting that the Internet is only is, is devoid of any human affect or irrationality uh, or, or embodiment, right? And keep on pretending. So that's why I hate the cloud so much, right? This idea of the cloud, which seems to be like a metaphor where it all just resides up there uh, along, over, overlooking the Californian fires and the melting snow caps. Like there is this cloud uh, which we don't need to worry about anymore because it comes with such a promise of of, of, the, of the ephemeral and the immaterial. So I'm actually very skeptical of using the Internet of Things. I'm much, more I'm much more comfortable talking about physical computation networks because that's what Internet of Things is. It's physical computation networks where we are in fact rebuilding um, the mainframe at a much larger scale, right? So if once upon a time the mainframe would would actually be larger than this room that we are in, right? And so um, being in computation literally means residing within a computer. Like you are in a machine and you are kind of playing the parts around it. I think the interesting thing about the Internet of Things is that we are now building a planetary computer. We are literally trying to rebuild our entire planet as a computation stack. And that there is something else that is at play here in terms of thinking about its politics, but also thinking about its affordability, its materiality, and the fact that we can, we have the audacity as a species to think about commodifying this planet as a giant consumable, uh, which can be just put together in terms of a series of stacks and transactions. So maybe that's, I, I don't, I'm not answering your question, no, but you know, it's just trying to think through this in a little that's way. That's great. I mean, um, the audacity of our species, exactly. I mean, by trying to recreate, just as you're saying, the whole world is this commodifiable thing, um, it reminds me of, um, of the alchemists, right? You yeah. know, the audacity to, of men to think that because they were so jealous they could not produce children, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, that, you know, the, um, then it became about, well, we could play God, we can, you know, yeah. we can create anything we want, you know, this kind of thing. Um, so maybe that's an, actually an interesting kind of um, slide into that uh, side of your thought, into the feminist side of your thought, but also the, you know, thinking about um, the potentials, like, for example, there have been many cases now of uh, the Internet of Things, these devices being used to torment people, you know, um, 
couple split up, uh, the ex-husband still has the password, he's turning on the, you know, the heat full blast in the middle of the night, turning on the stereo at like weird times and things like that to kind of torment his ex-spouse. Um, it's something I kind of think of as what I call hacker advantage as well, because you don't have to be a hacker necessarily, but, um, but how far have we come really? We keep talking about, like you say, girls in STEM, getting people to code. They still don't understand, though, how to crack these things open and get under the hood. How, how do we kickstart that revolution? <sighs> Big task. Rebooting the human species sometimes looks like a good idea. Um, there are times, I, I spend a lot of my time actually working with groups uh, that deal with sexual abuse and violence online, particularly towards queer and, uh, and, and people identifying as women. And there are times in the night when I end working on that and I do some policy and advisory work, and then I read a climate change report which tells us that the world's going to die in 30 years, and I feel so happy, saying, I think that's a good thing. Um, but apart from my inherent darkness, <laughs> which is hidden behind the interface of my happy uh, belonging, um, I think... I think we can't wait for the revolution to start. And you are actually giving a more benign version of hacker privilege. Um, give, me, give me the dark version. The dark one is what we recognize as revenge pornography, mm -hmm. right? The capacity to reduce somebody you have a grudge against into nothing but a sexual spectacle of shame, and then using societal norms of shame in order to torment her, to destroy her, uh, to abuse her uh, through this distance, right? So using extension of technology to barely just abuse you towards a particular person. And if you start looking at revenge pornography laws across the world, I mean, in the EU it's slightly better, but not much. Uh, there is a very very scary thing that's emerging. Again, I think I, like I'm repeating myself, but let me give you the story of somebody called Kayla Laws. So Kayla Laws and Charlotte Laws will go down in history because they were the first... Um, people who could take down this company called isanyoneup.com. I don't remember that. Is which is a, yeah, it's a good thing. I'm, 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 I'm also hesitant in asking the audience saying, does anybody know it? Because if you know it, it means that you were participating in a revenge pornography website, which leaked images and videos of women taken in compromising positions without their consent. And then they would use the same principles that we cherish so much of crowdsourcing, that they would have multi thousands upon thousands of men identifying those women using facial recognition algorithms to reverse detect who they are map it onto their Facebook and their Twitter portfolios, and then send letters and videos to their workplaces in order to shame and harass them. Hunter Moore and Gary Evans, these are the two names we should remember, had been running this website for nine years, and they had never been able to be, they were not shut down because they claimed that this was their, in the US context, this was their um, first amendment to free speech, right? Kayla Laws was a 19-year-old a student in California whose mother, Charlotte Laws, happens to be a fantastic human rights and privacy lawyer. Kayla Laws is iCloud account got hacked. Remember a couple of years ago when all these celebrities also got their iCloud account hacked? Like Emma Watson became the big The fappening. Name. The fappening, thank you. God. Sorry to be all so right. crude. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, uh, it's just describing That's what reality. Reddit called it. Yeah. Um, and so they, they, they fought a case against isanyoneup.com. And they won. But do you know why they won? They did not win because this website was extorting a 19-year-old and saying, if you give us $500, we will remove your content. Not because there was abuse, not because there was misogyny. They won the case because they could make a forensic evidence argument that the people of the website had hacked Kayla's account and stolen her data, right? The sanctity of data was more important than the sanctity of the body being abused. This is the future of Internet of Things if we allow it to be only disembodied and without the people. And plus, we also don't own our own data half the time, right? Yeah. So this is like, you know, it's about Facebook's right to our data, or it's about, yeah. you know, some other large yeah. whatever. Behemoths. Or the cloud, right? Or it's all cloud. always up in the cloud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and often uh, these things fall to kind of like, well, why don't put things in the cloud in the first place? But often we have no choice. It, it inevitably becomes a kind of thing if you don't have much choice. I mean, if you're collaborating with colleagues and we're all using Google Docs or whatever, and it's kind of like, oh, come on, you know, like just, you know. It's just Google. Yeah, it's just Google. It's just Google. <laughs> it's okay. It's just them. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, I have one other thing I'd like to say. I mean, and I, I'm going to try to steer it back into a brighter place. Um, and if anyone else has any brighter, happier, um, cheerier points, they're free to make them. Um, but uh, what, are, what do you think? I mean, because you spoke a lot in your uh, concluding remarks about um, the need for critique and the need for situating critique. Um, but what are the... I mean, I'm thinking in this this age of kind of like uh, fractured attention, what are the um, most effective, in your opinion, vectors for this critique? I mean, Twitter, I, I can shout on Twitter all day, but, you know, I only have like, I don't know how many followers, it doesn't matter, you know, like, and it's, it's not going to make a difference, right? So... If you, if you tell them your username now, they will all join you. <laughs> That's what these things are for, to get right. followers on Instagram and Twitter. Okay. okay. At M. Kasperzak, if you can spell it. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, well, we could just write some kind of manifesto right now on Twitter together if you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wish I had an answer. I don't, but mm -hmm. I do have a lot of faith despite all... Yeah, I'm, I'm being critical and I'm exaggerating my affect of despair. Um, but one of the groups that I've been working with over the last three years, and this is like a shameless plug, is called the Feminist Internet Research Network, or FERN. And one of the things that FERN does is brings together technologists, feminists, artists, and designers to start saying that we can redesign the internet. The internet is a political expression. It comes from certain ideologies of optimization, of efficiency, of transfer, of distribution, and so on and so forth. If you can code, you know that there is always a choice to code differently. And the one thing that the FERN has done, that it has come up with feminist principles of the internet, where you talk about the questions of care and body and protection as a default and not something that you do after the crime has happened. You don't first say, I'm going to use the internet. I know it's evil. I know it's going to, I'm, going to wa I'm going to wait till things happen on it. And then I'm going to ask for regulation and saying, now protect my data. No, the fact that our data is not in our ownership is a technological choice that was made. And there is a possibility in the hardwiring and in the coding to kind of, just kind of revert this all over again. So I think, I think we are finally getting to the point where we are no longer talking about things like open source or open access, which were actually just licensing problems and had nothing to do with uh, the actual materiality of the internet, right? Because open source languages were as complicit in reinforcing the internet ideology of a, of a Silicon Valley hypermasculine bro culture uh, as anything else was. So I think what's becoming interesting with the democratization of the computer, not of the interface, but of the computer, is that more and more people are redesigning these, these sequences. And trying to find them, locate them, and empowering them is where perhaps the future is going to be. Yeah, I mean, there's a question of, I guess, like, how far down do we need to burn it all down? Because, like, there's actually the question of, you know, like, the code layer is one thing, the hardware layer is another thing, the designed devices that we all use. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah burn the whole thing, maybe? No, not you know? burn the whole thing at all, because there is a lot of strength there in terms of the possibilities it has to offer. Yeah. Just make another future possible. Mm. Right? Not take up the scripts yeah. which are already coded in it and mm. saying, hey, that's what you do with it. I'm going to do something entirely different and then figure out how to get there. I think that's, that's where the challenge is going to be. Right. There's, like, I guess, a place for the subversion of what exists? Um, really not subversion, but just an alternative. Like, yeah. I don't even want to fight this particular thing. Right, it's broken, right. and I don't want okay. to fix it either. I just want to start something else, and that can be the new internet. Yeah, And good, that's possible. Fair. Yeah, 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 I think that's true, yeah. 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 Does anyone want to have the, um, the cube thrown at them? Would anyone like that? <laughs> that's very scary. <laughs> it's kind of soft and round. Roundish, just, rounded corners. Whoop. You can just hold it and... Here we go. Like Omo, you can just... Like Omo. Like yeah. Omo, you can just hold it Cradle and press it, it against you. Yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really enlightening Thank and you. inspiring. I, I have a kind of naive question, but uh, maybe you can uh, help me. What would happen if, for example, overnight, by miracle, data could not be sold and bought anymore? Like, it became completely impossible to have any economic transactions on it. Wow, that's not a naive question. That's a fundamentally utopian question, and thank you for it. Um, what might be really interesting is to realize that the data is not the same as information. 
right? Data is an abstraction. There is a much larger messy informationality, which as human beings we are quite aware of. And there is a very limited amount of that information which can be commodified because machines learn that and they produce it as data, which can be stored in a database, it can be sorted and so on. So I'm making a very technical uh, ontological distinction between information and data. What would be really interesting is to start recognizing that if we build an alternative economy, which is not about data but about information, there is a different set of negotiations which can be put into place. Again, it sounds like a utopian answer, but because it's a utopian question. But when I look at the work of people like Kelly Dobson, that's precisely what they are doing. Right? The, the data that we have in terms of making our electronics run through smart switches and so on and so forth is a very specific kind of data set. If, it, if, 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 you, if you are not intelligible to that machine, you are, the machine will not operate. Um, in India, which is my home country, um, we're having a lot of trouble right now with biometric databases, for example, for the simple reason that people who design biometric devices never thought of populations which work so hard with their hands that they don't have fingerprints which can be read. Right? And none of us have experienced it because none of us have done manual labor over a sustained period of time. But if you do it, you now suddenly face with a population which who, who is informationally present, but cannot become data verified by a machine. Now, th there are two options here. One is to make the machine so that it can read more information. But the other is to say, well, this is my informationality, and you will still have to deal with me even if I do not open myself up for the commodification or transaction. So I don't ever think of a world where we are not going to transact in data because we have always transacted in data even before the digital technologies come into being, right? Through censuses, through censuses, through state making, through different policies, these are all data sets of certain kind which measure the human and its interactions and how it works within the social setting that it's installed in. But what would be important is to in fact champion and protect the messiness and the diversity of information which cannot be read as data. And then the rights to be forgotten, the rights to be irrational, the rights to just be, are in fact existing in these spaces. And I think, especially for artists and designers, this is why I enjoy working with Artes, which is an art university so much, because this is where our job is. Uh, not merely to visualize a data transaction, but find out that which cannot be transacted and still occupy it with this fierce humanism and saying, this is where I stand and speak with me, even if I don't speak your language. So that might be some way of doing it. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Any other takers of the hot potato? <laughs> wasn't there a song? Hot potato, hot potato. No, no, there wasn't a song. I'm just trying okay. to make it up. I'm just feeling very scared that somebody's going to throw it at me and then I will have to ask myself <laughs> a question. <laughs> And then it will go into like a bizarre cybernetic feedback loop of me answering myself. Oh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, right. As long as no dolphins are involved, I think we're all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Leave the dolphins in the. Oh, I see a hand. <laughs> Woo! Catch. Um, thanks, Nishant. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about what you think is the core of the resistance of most people to, who are users of um, the internet to see uh, those bodies, to, to recognize them. Because it's my experience that most, or you know, a lot of people, they're not particularly interested to know this about the cleaners who are behind. Yeah? So what's driving that resistance? The easy and depressing answer is apathy. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't believe that. So. I don't. I, I don't for one minute believe that uh, as a majority we are people who are just apathetic to the flight of other people. Maybe there is another technological way of engineering it. So in some of the other work I have done, I have, I have talked about information overload and what information overload does to our capacity to both observe as well as glean the truth that is coming our way. 
right? And my favorite example in talking about information overload is always the libraries in Alexandria. So in second century BC, when they were building the large libraries of Alexandria, one of the biggest questions was how many books should a person be allowed to read before that brain fries? Right? And in fact, uh, as an anecdotal thing, that was also the beginning of the position of the librarian. The librarian who was called the custodian of books, their job was not to get people to read books, their job was to stop people from reading books. Saying 10 books in a lifetime is enough. More than that, and you are going to you know, kind of slip into uh, some kind of a moral paralysis, and your capacity of truth telling is going to dissolve and you will end up electing Donald Trump as your president. Um, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I kind of like this idea that throughout the history of information sets, there has been um, an anxiety about information overload. And we have worked very hard at making sure that when we do slip into information overload, there will be ways of recovering from it, right? So there was continuous mechanisms put into place. With the digital, one of the ways by which politics has become secondary is that we have accepted information overload as our default state of being. We have accepted that we are ontologically, informationally overloaded now. And one of the key characteristics of information overload is that you are largely consuming information that you have produced about yourself. That's all that information overload does, because you are producing so much information and trying to keep track of all of it necessarily means that you are in a cybernetic feedback loop with yourself, which is also my anxiety of the cube being thrown at me. Right? That essentially within the digital networks, the thing that you talk to the most is yourself. And when that happens, it's not reluctance, but that every other information which is about somebody else, and especially somebody else who is not even made willingly visible to me, is essentially going to drift away. And I'm going to rely more and more on algorithms of information curation who are going to show me what I want to do. And that, that builds what Wendy Chern again calls the network neighborhood that you reside only within that network neighborhood of information as you are circulated and information is circulated around you in, in, in two different ways. And that, that's, a, that's a very strange vector of what Arjun Appadur I would call postmodernity, where the information that is circulating and the person who's receiving the information are both in simultaneous circulation, right? Which is, which is, a, which is a really strange way of kind of thinking about the being. So, that would be the way in which at least I'm trying to think through it. I refuse to believe that we have reached a point in civilization where we stopped caring. But we have reached a point where the care of our information is taking so much of our energy and time that there is not enough resources left to think about the other who is not a part of the same information data set. Yeah. Anything outside your network neighborhood is kind of becomes irrelevant. Yeah. And you never see it. So. You, you never see it, but you also, it's exhausting. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. yeah. Right? I, I don't know how many social media networks you are on, but I justify it, I mean, largely, I, it must be because I'm an attention queen, uh, but I justify it as part of doing research that I have 27 active social media accounts which I'm monitoring on a daily basis. Like, it's exhausting. I sometimes just keep on reading my own post which other people are retweeting just to see that if it's changed or not. Of course it's not changed, but I keep on reading it. Okay. So there's, the there's replies, something there. and the, yeah. And on yeah. and on and on and on and on. Yeah. There was a hand at the back, so if someone could throw the block cube. We have to give it a name. Omo. We'll just call it Omo. Oh, let's call let's it Omo. Let's call it Omo. Yeah. Omo. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm wondering a bit about this whole... So I've been thinking a lot about identity in the context of internet, in particular in terms of agency and the feeling of sovereignty. And wondering when you're saying the bodies behind the screen, the UI become actually all part of that system. And as soon as you then have no UI anymore, the user is essentially part of that system as well, right? So I'm kind of wondering, I guess, where, when we talk about especially like um, becoming gestures, the next kind of accessibility and interaction layer with the internet, what does that do to our sense of identity, um, agency, and sovereignty? Like, are we becoming the internet, or is the internet becoming us, or? Wow, um, if you don't write that book, I will. So I would, I would recommend putting that title out immediately, saying, are we becoming the internet? Um, but 
I, I thank you. I think that's a really interesting question because it does go back to the um, idea of what constitutes the human, right, in many ways. So when I do these kinds of talks, I often get somebody generally after the talk who comes to me and says, you sound like such an old fashioned humanist, right? You, you seem to be like almost stuck in the 1960s talking as if there is this human that we need to protect. And I continuously argue with them saying I'm not really. In fact, I'm drawing our attention to the fact that the human, any which way we understand it, is a model. It's a model f which can be supported by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for example, or by biological standards of we have 10 fingers and 10, 10 toes. Or you know, if you are on the right wing extremist side, then def defining whether you have a penis or not as a way of defining your bodies. But the fact is that the human being has essentially been a production of measurement. So what we think of as identity politics is in fact extreme measurements of different kinds, of race, of gender, of sexuality, of ethnicity, of history, of heritage, of lineage, and so on and so forth. What the digital has come and done is that it has opened up the fixity of our past and made it into something that can be predicted. So the best example of this is this bizarre 23 and Me testing kits. I don't know how many of people have given up given into that temptation? Did you send your DNA to be tested? You should do it. Because I, it, 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 it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> oh. oh, because That's it's- not what I was expecting no, you to No, no, no. You should, you should do it as a, as a thought experiment because it's incredible. So I gave in and saying, who cares, right? Like how much more of my data can they take? Here, take it. Um, um, so I send in, my, I send in my, like, my swab and then, then this result comes up. And then suddenly it says that I am 128th Portuguese, which is interesting, except that all I did was the two days was try and figure out which of my great grandparents was an adulteress, right? Because somebody in my family cheated with somebody who is in Portugal. Um, because as far as I can tell, they all are super Indian. But this DNA test suddenly has given me a profound truth about myself, which I would never have like, done, done this to me. Like if anybody had ever asked me saying, are you European? I would be like, no. Um, um, but suddenly now when they ask me, are you European, I'm very tempted to write in my next Inburkerings uh, form in the Netherlands, saying I'm, apparently I'm somewhere, I'm Portuguese, so now just give me an EU passport, right? Um, and they will not take it at face value, but this is reconstituting the human through different kinds of variables. It's measuring it in a completely different way. And while this looks like a fairly benign exercise, uh, in India right now, there is a national registry which is being made in Assam, in the northeast of India, where using these kinds of measurements, which are also about language and ethnicity, the Indian government is trying to criminalize tens of thousands of people who are Muslim and who might have migrated from Bangladesh into India and saying that you might live here, this is who you claim you are, but we are now going to measure you in a different way and in that process invalidate you as citizens of this country and just throw you back to where you belong, right? It, it gets dark really fast. But this is what it is. It's the measuring not of the identity, but looking at what are the new measures of the human that we are engaging in and what are the models that we are going to accept as the new human, so not the cyborg. Right? Not the technology and the human cohabiting. Not even the post-human. Though I, I, I am deeply indebted both to Donna Haraway and Rosie Bradotti for the fantastic work that they do, but I'm arguing not the cyborg, not the post-human, merely the human. Yeah. Recalibrating what it means to be human, that's where the new identity politics and the new claims of truth are also going to belong. Absolutely, I mean, I think, yeah. You're no argument here. Uh, let's pass the, pass the block along. I think we have time for maybe one more, if anyone has any final remarks, questions. Comment, not a question. Any of those? Yeah. It's, it's neither of those, okay. but um, you said some amazingly uh, insightful things tonight, but I'd like you to repeat the name of the feminist internet organization that you were talking about and i'd like you to repeat the names of the women who overthrew the uh, misogynist website sure so i can remember um, who they are absolutely it's called the feminist internet research network or fern it's organized by a, a consortium of gender technology uh, 
activist and rights advocates called APC, the Association of Progressive Communication. They are based in South Africa, Sri Lanka, and England. And they run a global network which has been working on questions of gender technology for a long time. And the case study that I was referring to, it's a mother-daughter duo in California. The names are um, Kayla, K-A-Y-L-A, and Charlotte Laws. Um, and as a shameless Google search engine optimization plug, if you search for my name and revenge pornography, you will find the essays I have written around them um, very easily. And most of my work is open access, so you might be able to get more details about the case as well. Thank you. Great. Well, I think we should we should wrap it up here, and so that we have more time for all those people that want to corner you later oh, with yeah. the with the personal <laughs> questions. But can we have one round round of applause, please? One more for Nishant Shah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.